as I said, it'll be brief and painless. Um, welcome to the fifth annual UL Carry event sponsored by the UL Carry Institute at uh, Wagner College. Now, there are only two institutes that do this type of work that we do in publishing monographs, op-ed pieces, writing books. My co-author here, he was before, was there he is. Oh, yeah. and he's eating. He has a mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one is the Rockefeller Institute uh, in SUNY, in Albany. And they, of course, are supported by the state of New York. And uh, the other one is the Cary Institute uh, that is supported by your kindness and your generosity, and we very much appreciate it. Uh, at this part of the uh, program, which will be brief as I said, I would be remiss if I did not introduce to you our host and hostess, who I think the vast majority of you know, and that is Steve Aiello and Lorraine. Rumor here that one quarter of you were students of mine. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> but I discovered a third student who walked in tonight. And uh, even though uh, Steve Aiello was not a permanent student, uh, one day, soon. one day, we left. <laughs> we, we, we had enough after one day. We actually, we actually taught each other when we were at New York City Board of Education, when education was controlled by a Board of Education. <laughs> enough said about that. And uh, Steve was an outstanding, has been an outstanding uh, public servant and uh, he has been a wonderful friend for, I hate to say it, but for many more years, almost 40 years, Steve, yes, right? Steve. Almost 40 years. And uh, thank goodness we had a good man uh, succeeding me as president, a member of the um, New York City Board of Education, and that was Steve Aiello. And I remember a few years later, uh, President Carter sent Stu Eisenstadt to New York and um, asked if I thought that Steve Aiello would be the right person to uh, work for President Carter as a special assistant for urban affairs and interethnic affairs. And I said, what do you mean? He's the best person in the nation. Don't look any further. And Steve spent some wonderful years in the Carter administration. And after uh, the Reagan uh, White House arrived, the Carter White House had to leave. And then Steve decided to go into the private sector. He was at uh, Burson and Marstella. And um, as I believe, the president of their largest division. And he was the chief executive uh, officer afterwards at Conan Wolf, and then he uh, uh, was also uh, at, what is it? Uh, Hill and Nolten Strategies. <laughs> Strategies, and in between that, he was a outstanding uh, public servant uh, in a vol voluntary capacity, and Lorraine, uh, I remember uh, the presidents of the Board of Education had to serve on the uh, were also ex-official members of the Educational Construction Fund, who would have dreamt that an Aiello would become the president and CEO of the school. Construction at the right. The school at right. And, uh, and that is uh, her position right now. And uh, I want to thank you, Lorraine. I really want to thank my old friend, Steve, uh, for having this event in this beautiful apartment and the reason why my back is to the UN is that I want you to see it. <laughs> I could say something else, but I won't. <laughs> Don't go no in. politics at <laughs> that tonight. And uh, again, many, many thanks. And uh, Steve said that uh, I think the president would uh, 
uh, be interested that he would be interested in uh, joining an advisory committee for the Cary Institute in the future. So thank you very much. Steve, as our host, please say a few words. My very, friend. very few. First, I, I want to, on behalf of Lorraine and myself, welcome you all to our home. So many old friends and hopefully new friends. I thank Seymour for his very, very kind words. And when he asked me about this, I thought, absolutely. First of all, my dear friend, and I won't repeat what Seymour said. Second, a man who I hold in the highest esteem, who's done so much for New Yorkers and the nation, Dick Ravitch, who is our keynote speaker. And then Governor Carey, who I had the privilege, honor, and pleasure to not only know, but work with when he was a congressman, and then certainly as a governor. And I will put on now my historian's hat and give a statement that the historians in the room can either challenge or not challenge, and I don't think this room they're going to challenge it, one of the finest and best governors of New York State we've ever had. So thank you so much and enjoy. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, we're also pleased uh, to have with us tonight uh, two sons of one of the greatest, if not the greatest, governor of New York State, uh, and that is Michael Carey and Tommy Carey. <laughs> <laughs> a few more citizens who might walk in later. <laughs> How big is the dinner table? <laughs> uh, almost as large as the bar. <laughs> Okay, um, the next person I want to introduce uh, have the far side and vision of realizing uh, that the Cary Institute, if it was housed at Wagner College, would not only be good for the state of New York and good for the nation, good for Wagner College, but because its objective is to reform government, good for reforming government, in New York State and the United States. It gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce to you someone who is one of the foresighted presidents of a college, university, that I have met, and I mean this most sincerely. Uh, and that is a man who's able to combine, and very few administrators can do this, able to combine a vision, a dream, a mission, academic excellence, and someone who is an outstanding administrator. As my cousin Abe, who's here, knows, they're few and far between. Uh, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce to you, I don't, might not have known him 40 years, but in the last six, seven years, I've been a delight, the president of Wagner College, and one of the major reasons why the Cary Institute, along with the late Governor Cary and a few others, exists today, Dr. Richard Garassi. Thank you, and thank you all for being here. It's great, Stephen, thank you so much. It means so much to us, I can't tell you. It's good to see old friends. It's good to see Dave Lockman. When I, Dave used to be with CICU, which was the Commission for the Independent College Universities after he left the legislature. And uh, so he was our executive director for all, everyone from Columbia and Cornell down to the Little Sisters of the Poor. And he, a, he represented us beautifully, and I, we just became friends. And then I met Seymour, and I said, I know I'm the third Lockman. It has to be. It has to be. <laughs> But anyway, thank you all for being here. We have two trustees, I believe, here, or former trustees. We have Aletta Kip Diamond, who is here. Aletta is way in the back. And we have Michael Nicholas is sitting right here. Margaret Nicholas sitting next to him. They're both class of 49. Bob Diamond is also here. So I'll be very brief. Some of you don't know Wagner. Uh, so you don't know where Staten Island is. So I understand this. And I didn't know I grew up in Brooklyn. The first time I went to Staten Island was when I even for to be a provost at the college. So you don't need a tetanus shot or a passport any longer. The ferry is free. Um, Wagner is 2,300 students. It's 85% uh, residential. Students come from 44 countries. 
uh, uh, from 44 states and 11 countries. Uh, our big commitments are in uh, science and in theater, uh, but we are very strong in professional programs like nursing and education, and physician assistant and pre-med, <coughs> very strong pre-med program. Um, I myself am a political scientist, uh, and I should tell you that um, one of the signatures of Wagner College, certainly in the 15 years that I've been there, but I think long before me, uh, is this tremendous commitment to public service. Uh, we have a variety of arrangements that involve our students by requirement as part of courses involved in field work. Uh, but the goal at Wagner College is to increase their learning in the disciplines they're studying when they're doing this work, increase their civic knowledge and civic engagement, and make an impact in the communities in which they're working in. So that's the formula we use. We're very, very proud of that. Uh, and it's, uh, I hope that you get the chance to come out and see Wagner if you haven't seen it at all. It's a stunningly beautiful campus. We're right on the New York Harbor. Those are some of our former alumni. They're probably chasing down the street there. <laughs> our business program. But, uh, um, but, uh, but really do come. All of us, uh, of course, know us quite well. But I don't want to stay on too long. I want to thank you all for supporting the Cary Center. If ever we needed a nonpartisan uh, force that would be speaking uh, to the notion of efficiency in government, of effectiveness of government, of a commitment to others, it's now in this highly polarized situation we find ourselves in, to inspire young people to get involved in government service and public service in a variety of ways it's now. The Cary Center brings to the table from a very even-handed way an analysis of existing public problems and a notion of reforming state government, not just New York, but we've also talked about New Jersey, which will be the big climb, and then uh, Wisconsin and a number of other places, <laughs> California, uh, and the like. But we, we really are quite serious about it, and the, and the Institute's very important to us. So I'm going to get it off because I want to hear what Richard Rabbits has to say. I always listen to what Richard has to say. So thank you so much for being here, and I'll get a chance to meet you during the evening. Thank you. I also want to add to what uh, Richard Grassi has just said, that uh, this fall, he'll be celebrating his 10th anniversary as president of Wagner College. If you can make that event, make it. if you can, we're looking forward to the 20th anniversary in a few years, God willing. And, uh, and Karen Grassi. <laughs> It doesn't happen without her pleasure. I mean, okay. she's a professor in the education department. She's fabulous. Now, I want to introduce, um, I see so many faces that I know, and I would be remiss. I felt apologized for introducing you. Um, but I know that since we have used his home in the past, and we're going to use it, we got in the future, is Richard Hoffman still here? Yay, yeah. yeah. hey, here he is. Oh, right. Sitting next to you. Uh, thanks for everything, Richard. And uh, one person I have to introduce, um, because you could blame my going into public life on this gentleman. <laughs> one of the great jurors that New York State has produced, former chief judge of the appellate court of New York State, and prior to that, deputy mayor under Mayor Lindsay, I would not think it. Dinkins, Dinkins, forgive me, on the Mayor Dinkins. But you were uh, an assistant to uh, Warren. <laughs> we're making you mil We're making you bipartisan. He is anyway. And uh, we have two generations of Mullins here, and we're pleased and delighted that you're here, Mill. And we hope that you'll be able to attend other functions in the future. Thank you very, very much. And now we go to the public servant par excellence, who is your major speaker for this evening. Uh, I thought I knew something about Dick Ravage's contributions to the state of New York and to the public service that he gave to the people of the, of the state of New York. But I'm not going to read to you the bio that I received from him. He gave me a shorter version and a larger version. And we're going to use part of the shorter version, but there are certain things that I have to say. 
Here is a man who was an outstanding businessman. Uh, he was uh, the head of HRH, was it construction? Yes. And of course, R stands for uh, Ravage. I'm not sure who the H is for, but uh, <laughs> let us know. And he gave up a career in order to enter public service. Here is a man who was instrumental. And by the way, I was interviewed recently about the uh, situation in Detroit and Michigan, and I recommended to them that they start a uh, economic development council, an urban development council, where, which was almost bankrupt when uh, uh, Dick Ravage took it over. Uh, <coughs> Uh, reorganized the entire Metropolitan Transit Authority and uh, reorganized it again afterwards, was appointed by Congress to uh, do a major study in uh, the area uh, in uh, the area of housing for the nation. Here is a man who has never given up public service, who served as the CEO of the bank who's still involved in uh, legal matters and business matters. He is, but one of his major contributions, as Rob and I have discovered, is how he helped and aided Governor Carey, one of the most outstanding people in that administration, who brought New York City and New York State back from the brink, brink of bankruptcy. And uh, we're very, very fortunate in having this gentleman in the state of New York, and we thank him for what he's done. And Dick, we're delighted that you're able to be with us tonight. I know what your schedule must be like, uh, day in and day out. He is working on some memoirs, and there are a few authors in this room, and maybe they can uh, look at the uh, the galleys before it comes <laughs> out. <laughs> but for all the work that Dick Ravage has done in the past, what he's doing now and what he will do in the future, Dick, we thank you from the bottom of our heart and thank you very, very much for making time available to speak at this event this evening. Okay? And we cannot forget that he was a heartbeat away, not from the presidency, but as Lieutenant Governor of New York. One of the most, if not the most, outstanding Lieutenant Governor New York has ever had. That's true. That's right. Uh, see, well, thank you. I, I'm glad you didn't read my uh, <laughs> uh, I did try for elective office once very unsuccessfully. <laughs> and I remember my son uh, introduced me at a church in Queens and somebody gave him my curriculum vitae, and he saw all this list of things that I'd done, and he got up and he said, <clears throat> my father's a wonderful dad, and he can't hold one job for too long. <laughs> 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 it was the best introduction. <laughs> you know, I am here for two reasons. Uh, one, uh, the fact that Wagner College has decided to, uh, or decided some time ago, that the study of government and politics was a very, very high priority. It's something that means a lot to me because it is, in my judgment, one of the most uh, uh, misunderstood uh, topics. Uh, uh, and I think one of the major reasons why you see government performing so inadequately today is because not enough people uh, have learned enough about it. So I'm here be to, to help Wagner College. I'm also here, obviously, because there's nobody that I have ever known in public life who comes close to uh, Hugh Carey in terms of his qualities. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about Hugh Carey and, and begin by saying that I recently attended a retrospective about uh, Lyndon Johnson's presidency. It was a wonderful evening. Uh, Fritz Mondale was there, George McGovern, Joe Califano, Bill Moyers, 
and uh, Johnson's daughter, Lucy Baines, and they all tell stories about Lyndon Johnson. And at the end, I think it was Fritz Mondale who said, you know, Lyndon Johnson had a great zest for politics, and he liked politicians. And you cannot govern effectively in a democracy by being above politics. And Hugh Carey was a man who loved politics. He was a man who had an incredible depth of knowledge about how uh, the commercial world functioned. And he had this uncanny ability to be equally comfortable sitting talking to Walter Riston, the chairman of Citibank, as he was talking to uh, Meet Esposito. I don't think he ever got along that well with me. <laughs> um, or Pat Cunningham or uh, whoever. Uh, he really was. And I had never met Hugh Carey in my life. And he called me in January, a week or two after he was sworn in as governor said that he had been advised that the New York State Urban Development Corporation, which had been Nelson Rockefeller's favorite toy, uh, was no longer financeable. They were constructing 30,000 units uh, of affordable housing around the, <clears throat> the state, and he wondered if I would be willing to come in and help uh, try to avoid a bankruptcy. And that's how I met him. And I, I worked very closely with him. Uh, for quite a period of time, and I have to tell you, the three people who were closest to him then were Peter Goldmark, his budget director, Dave Burke, his secretary, and Judah Griffiths, his counsel. And they, like me, had never met <coughs> Hugh Carey before he was sworn in as governor. Now, what a remarkable thing. I don't know any other politician who reached out to get talent, if I forgive the self-description, uh, um, and uh, but they were decisions that were also political in the sense uh, that Dave Burke had a relationship with the Kennedys, Judith Ribbons had a relationship with Bob Wagner, who had been a key uh, supporter of Hugh Carey in the primary against Howard Samuels. Uh, and I can't say Peter Goldmark had any political connection, but he had worked for John Lindsay in some law. Uh, and at the very time that Hugh Carey interviewed him and asked him to be budget director, he had just flown back from uh, California where he was interviewed by Jerry Brown, newly elected governor of California, the first time uh, for the budget director's job here. And <clears throat> Why, why do I weave these two things together? Because the problems that you carry solved and the uh, uh, issues that he confronted and the changes he made in governance, whether it was the judiciary or the care of the mentally uh, ill in this, in this state, uh, all in addition to what he talk for hours about how his unique skills, his unique personality had so much to do with what uh, uh, saved New York at the, in, in 1975. And I, I will tell you the reasons why, in my judgment. One, unlike every other politician I have known, we have known all the governors and all the mayors for a long time. Uh, uh, Hugh Carey was not self-important. He was not in any way a narcissist. He, he had his own insecurities at some level, uh, um, and he struggled always to know what the right thing to do was from the public point of view. And to the best of my knowledge, he never made a, a decision on an important subject that hadn't been, um, that wasn't in his view the right thing to make without regard 
to the political consequences. But he was naive about politics. And he communicated with the legislature. Uh, Warren Anderson, Stanley Steinbeck, uh, Stanley Fink, uh, and uh, our guest here, Freddie Orenstein, uh, will testify as well today. And he kept enough of a distance because he was the governor and he was not trying to be everybody's pal at the same time. He developed a long relationship with people. And there was a degree of personal uh, um, confidence, uh, believability, respect, uh, uh, not always affection. I recently had the opportunity to spent a few hours with George Schultz in Stanford last week. And I was telling uh, George Schultz about Hugh Carey. He didn't really know Hugh Carey. And, and I was telling him about the Johnson thing. And he said, you know, it reminds me, Ronald Reagan was once asked if he was in fact as partisan as he appeared to be. And he said, only before 5 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> So, you all know Kerry's accomplishments. Um, and if not, you can certainly buy Seymour's and Rob's book. <laughs> uh, but what was so unique about this was that he never uh, uh, used those accomplishments to, uh, to push himself. Uh, <coughs> There was no braggadocio about him. Uh, he struggled with an enormous responsibility for 12 kids that he endured. Uh, and I can tell you, having been blessed with the, the friendship of those 12 kids, I can only tell you that during the years of Hugh Carey's illness, just to tell you what a remarkable family it is, those kids were in touch with each other practically every day. And on any, any given day, there was one of them who was so the responsibility to make sure that their father uh, was attended to and, and taken care of. Uh, and he managed to do that. Uh, I remember playing uh, basketball with Thomas when I was a little kid in the backyard of the, uh, of the mansion in our neighborhood. He was having to stay there when I was a woman. Uh, and how he did that, ran the state of New York, was uniquely responsible, knew every copious detail of every step in, in, the, in the city financial recovery. And I'm just going to tell you three stories about that and then why this up. One, uh, um, you all probably remember the famous headline in uh, the Daily News, Ford to New York dropped dead. They had refused to help New York at all. And then in October of 75, we came perilously close to having to file bankruptcy. And there was a real concern as to whether or not the NAC, the Municipal Assistance Corporation bonds, would be uh, bought by the market. Uh, um, and um, Governor Carey uh, went to Washington and played golf the Secretary of Defense, Mel Laird, who was President of the Lord's closest friend. Now, I have no idea uh, what happened or what was said, but I suspect uh, that there was nothing more than a lot of warmth, a lot of friendship, intermixed with a pretty accurate description about how apocalyptic it would be if New York City actually had to file bankruptcy. And um, though he never even privately claimed credit for Ford's decision, there is none of us who were involved who don't believe that the respect and affection that he was held in, the, uh, uh, in Washington had so much to do with the ultimate response. Second thing I want to tell you is that um, I and I didn't hear this from you, Kerry, as I said, he never blew his own trumpet, at least not in my awareness. Uh, but I was told by others, including a number of the people, who, like Al Marshall, who around Nelson Rockefeller, 
for years. And Nelson Rockefeller, when he was governor, and Hugh Carey was a member of the Ways and Means Committee, and he relied on Hugh Carey uh, uh, for anything important that affected the state of New York. And any cause or interest that uh, Nelson Rockefeller had uh, that he wanted to come bring to the attention uh, of the governmental establishment in Washington, he did it through Hugh Carey. And uh, when Nelson Rockefeller came to the conclusion, this is like a good news, bad news joke, but came to the conclusion that, uh, uh, that in addition to Medicare, which was Lyndon Johnson's most passionate cause, that we needed also, in adjunct to the poverty program, to provide health care benefits for the very poor, he called Hugh Carey. Uh, and Hugh Carey introduced him to Wilbur Mills, and uh, it was Wilbur Mills who got Johnson to uh, uh, append the Medicaid uh, bill to the Medicare bill, uh, and that never would have happened. There'd be, whatever one may think about Obama health care, there would be millions and millions of people who would not be getting adequate health care if that wasn't true. Third story I want to tell you is that um, um, uh, when uh, <clears throat> Hugh Carey uh, endorsed uh, for mayor, well, I should tell you first that in 1975, whenever we had a meeting about a fiscal crisis, he would always say to me or some, Judah or someone, uh, uh, call Ed Koch. Ask him to come. I, I like Ed. I want some member of the congressional delegation to be current about what's going on in the city. But in 1977, uh, the governor of the mistake that he uh, acknowledged uh, in subsequent years uh, endorsed Mario Cuomo for mayor over Ed Koch and a being in the spring of 1977. I'm sure Milton remembers that. <laughs> uh, and uh, um, and uh, <clears throat> the, the, it didn't matter much, but it, it, it being resented it enormously, um, so did Ed Koch, and relationships uh, were, were somewhat frosty to say the least. And there was a period, as you know, ups and downs of politicians where Koch was riding high in the polls, and the governor wasn't doing so great in the polls. Uh, uh, um, but I can tell you that uh, until he, uh, his term ended in 1982, on any important issue, uh, um, Ed Koch and Hugh Carey worked very closely together. And they were very different people. And um, Hugh Carey uh, uh, always respected what Ed Koch was doing and always said, you know, he likes to do things the same way I do. Get the best people you possibly can, not measure them by what they did to help you get elected. And uh, Ed Koch, if he were here today, he would probably eagerly echo everything I'm saying about Hugh Carey. So he was a remarkable man. And, uh, you were very, very smart uh, uh, to be the institution uh, that chose Hugh Carey to be the, uh, uh, the name of the Institute of, of Government and, that you study. And I wish you luck. And I, on behalf of the host, Steve Seymour, president of the college, uh, join your wall and, and, uh, and thanking you for helping the college. And, helping preserve Hugh Carey's name. Thank you, Dick Ravage, for putting into perspective the greatness of Hugh Carey and the need for a Carey Institute to perpetuate his name and to perpetuate his program in terms of reforming government not only in New York State, but in the 50 states of the United States. Thank you all for coming. Don't leave yet. There's a lot of wine left. There are hors d'oeuvres still. 
and I know many of you haven't seen each other for a, a number of years, not 30 or 40 years, <laughs> but uh, maybe 30 or 40 months. Please stay and uh, thank you all for coming this evening and supporting the U.S. Carrie Institute at Wagner College.